The winds guide you. What's up guys, Classic Winds back again. Have you ever wondered what it's like to be in a top vanilla WoW guild? I'm sure a lot of us aspire to be in one, but not many people actually know the details of being a member. So today, we're here to talk about hardcore vanilla WoW raiding guilds. How are raiding guilds different in vanilla compared to how they will be in classic? I'd say that casual guilds will feel basically the same. Even progression guilds will feel very similar, but the very top guilds will be very different. That's because of the amount of min-maxing that's been discovered over the years, improvements in strategies, the experience players have gained, and the advances in technology over the years. Things like Discord, texting, applications on your phone, things like that. Before we begin, I'll say that 99.9% .9 of guilds won't do all the things I talk about, but it's expected that they will do a large amount. So don't be scared by this stuff. This, these are just extreme examples meant to educate you so that you have an idea of what may be expected in a top guild. So basically, what is a hardcore guild and who are they made for? So in my opinion, hardcore guilds are basically communists. The definition of communism is an economic system in which the property and resources are primarily controlled and owned by everyone. So when somebody else in the guild gets an item like a Perdition's Blade, you should be happy. That's like you getting the item. Think, think of it like this. You're not an individual. You are the guild. That's the idea. In my experience, being a selfish player in a hardcore guild does not work. If all you care about is loot, you'll probably have a bad time because 40-man raids drop very few items. Also, guild goals are guild accomplishments. Things like like uh, ringing the gong and thunder fury, these are guild efforts, this is not an individual effort. Methods recruitment post for BFA is basically what the top classic guilds are going to follow as well. When it comes to criticism, you should be able to handle constructive criticism if and when it's directed at you. Commitment. All applicants should have a good attitude towards raiding. You will be required to dedicate yourself to min-maxing not only your main character, but also maintain alt characters. During progression raids, the schedule is very demanding, raiding 12 to 15 hours a day, and it's really important you understand this before even thinking about applying or approaching someone in the guild. That way you don't waste their time or your time. And for classic, those time requirements do sound fairly accurate, but you probably won't spend the 12 hours a day raiding, you'll spend a ton of time preparing for the raids. And we'll, we'll look into that over the course of the video. If you think all hardcore guilds do is raid, you'll be very surprised, because there's a ton of requirements that have very little to do with raiding. Let's look at some of the less known requirements these guilds often have. Level 20 Warlock Alts. Everyone in a guild may be required to have a level 20 Warlock. That way, if you have to move 40 people to locations like raid entrances, world boss spawn locations, or world buff locations, it's very easy and quick. Uh, you usually keep them wherever you're told, they will be a designated location, and you'll often be expected to have a clicker alt as well which is just like a level 1 character that's kept in the same spot so you can click portals to summon other people. Raid Taxes So some guilds may require you to pay around 20 gold to attend each raid that you go to. The gold will typically all go to the guild bank, which is a guild alt character because there are no actual banks in classic. So the idea is that when you clear the raid, the bosses drop a certain amount of gold and then the gold that's taken is then used for the guild so you can get your tanks like fire resist or a nightfall weapon for the guild or even find a scarab lord. Alright, world bosses. World bosses are typically camped by top guilds. But how? It's through scouting. So when a world boss dies, they won't respawn for a few days. Uh, so after a few days go by, you'll have scouts on 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. They're gonna explore the area with an add-on, which will alert you when the mob is in the area. Sort of like this. This is where the technology part that I mentioned earlier comes into play. Because these days when you're scouting, if the world boss spawns, you have to get the message out to everyone in the guild. So how do they do that? Typically it's through Discord. They'll they'll set up a, mess, a world boss channel in Discord. You type in there that uh, Azurgos or Kazakh is spawned and everybody needs to get on. The message goes out to their phones and it's expected that you'll drop whatever you're doing and you're going to get online and come join for the world boss. And scouting is usually a mandatory requirement for guilds to do at least a few hours if you expect to get loot. So, reputation. Uh, some recipes are locked behind harsh rep grinds. So what we used to do was we used to recruit social players who were expected to grind these reps and craft these items for us. In exchange, we sometimes give them BOE trash items, which nobody would need. So it works out well for people who don't want to raid but still want to be in the top guild. That way they just still contribute to you guys. Uh, most guilds expect you to raid on alts. That way you can funnel the gear into a player's main character. This one's probably more well known, but having two to three alts in classic is actually very difficult. So the idea is that since less items drop if you just have one raid group, it's pretty unlikely that you're going to obtain a full set of best in slot items before the next raid tier releases. So this way, if you have multiple raid groups with alts, you funnel the gear to like 20 people between two groups. So 20 people in each group of 40 get super geared, that way when the next content releases, you combine the two groups of 20 into a super group, and then the 40 people go in and clear it slightly quicker than everybody else. Uh, basically that's the idea of min-maxing. 
Alright, so where do these guilds begin? A lot of these guilds are actually already recruiting their rosters in preparation for Classic WoW's launch. And before you even log in on day one, it's probably expected that you'll know the following things. You'll have picked a race that is best for the role, uh, Sori Torin Hunters and Night Elf Priests, uh, you probably don't fit in these types of guilds. You'll already have your name, class, and spec decided. That way, when you level up to 60, you already know exactly what your role is. Have the time to level up whenever Classic WoW launches. So whether this means booking time off of work, skipping dates, abandoning your family, ditching all your friends, whatever you need to do. Study and learn leveling routes, quests, strategies, and anything else that will help you hit level 60 as soon as possible. So now that you've decided that, we can fast forward to the launch. While leveling, gold, recipes, and BUE items are typically shared. So that means if your tank hit level 40 and only has 60 gold, it's probably expected that if you have the extra gold, you're going to spot that money to them so that they can buy their mount so they can level faster and get things started. When a pre-raid best in slot item, like one of these drops, uh, you may be expected to give them to the members who benefit from it the most. It's not about personal gain, it's about the society's gain, communism. And then there's usually a very strict timeline that you're expected to follow to hit level 60. I've seen some guilds asking for 7 days, I think this is insane personally, but I think it should be doable if you're experienced and dedicated. Alright, so you're level 60, you've done dungeons, you got your pre-raid best in slot, time to raid, right? No, still not yet. So you're gonna have to farm consumables. And here's an example of a Fury Warriors list of consumables before a raid night. You're probably not gonna use the entire list of consumables every night, but it's expected that you'll have them. And then you're gonna need to be on an hour or so early before raids typically to get your world buffs going. And what are some of the things the guild may control? Uh, professions. Often engineering is a requirement as it's a big DPS boost to have because of things like bombs, chickens, or engineering specific gear. Alchemists may even have their transmuting reserved for the guild. That way they can make Arcanite bars for the guild's needs. I already mentioned it earlier, but your spec. Uh, sometimes one person is assigned to be a spec that will boost other players' DPS, um, like the Frostmage buff or Shadow Priest buff. Hearthstone locations may be demanded to be set at locations such as uh, when doing Nax Ramis, Light's Hope Chapel, for AQ, Cenarian Hold, and for Molten Core's Horde, maybe Kargath. Alright, and lastly, meme specs. Uh, typically a guild will not allow you to bring a meme spec. However, since there are alt runs, they may allow it there. So if your dream third to hardcore raid is a Ret, Elemental Shaman, Boomkin, you have a very steep hill to climb, my friends. Alright, let's now look at what a typical schedule might look like. Generally, you'll spend most of your time farming consumables or gold to buy them, probably 3 or 4 hours a day depending on how good you are at it, uh, depending on how many characters you need consumables for, and depending on what you started with, of course. Uh, typically these guilds run dungeons daily, especially early on to get rare recipes and things, maybe a couple hours a day there. So basically, the further on into the game's life, the more raiding you're going to do. So early on, your your raid schedule is going to be the easiest time you'll ever have. And you might expect um, Anixia four times a week if you have your alt and your main, and Molten Core two times a week. And then later, you'll be squeezing in every raid. At that point, it can be extremely hard to keep up with a hardcore raiding guild schedule. So if you plan to enter a hardcore raiding guild, your role will also determine the amount of time that you're required to spend. Generally, the highest time investment, of course, goes to the guild master. They usually have the most work to do, managing officers, running the bank, raid leaders, sometimes the guild master will take that role, uh, sometimes they don't because it's also a very intensive role, you have to plan out strategies where people will go and manage everything on the fly. And then the officers, uh, generally the officers decide the loot in advance using a loot chart, uh, they spend a lot of time recruiting members, join in on decisions, help someone when they make a mistake, uh, pick up the slack when the, the GM is too busy. Uh, class leads, I think every hardcore raiding guild needs class leaders and they'll, they'll be people that understand their class class a lot, and they can manage specific classes, tell the warlocks what to do, uh, tell the healers who they're going to heal, what they're going to do, they'll be, they'll be in charge of a lot of people. It's good to have that spread out over the class leads. Your tanks, your DPS, and heals, that'll be most people in the raid. Uh, just players with good attitudes, committed to the guild, and then the social members or the benched members, there's still room for them in hardcore guilds, I think. Uh, they can help out with dungeons, they'll fill in when people can't attend once in a while, getting four people consistent is difficult. So I hope this video gave everybody some more ideas for what to expect from hardcore raiding in Classic WoW. Uh, personally, when I joined one, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. The very final thing I'll talk about, which was where I drew the line, was this. Hardcore guilds may expect you to practice on private servers before the content releases. 
So what our guild had asked us to do was to copy our character onto a different private server to practice the next raid before it released on the private server that we played on so that we could get server first on this private server with practicing on the next private server. That was something that in classic I genuinely hope that no hardcore guilds do this. It was the only thing I've talked about in the entire video that I couldn't agree with doing. So guys, do you think you'll join a hardcore guild? Am I totally wrong on all of this? Let me know in the comments. That's all I got for today. If you enjoyed the video, leave a like and subscribe because I'll be making more content soon. This has been Classic Wins. Thanks for watching.